And now it is my great pleasure to introduce to you and to welcome um, Dr. Kate Sullivan, who will be speaking for your session, which is autoimmunity and immunodeficiency. What's the relationship? Dr. Sullivan is a professor of pediatrics and the chief of the Division of Allergy and Immunology at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. She is also a member of the IDF USID Net Steering Committee, and she is the vice chair of the IDF Medical Advisory Committee. She is also our very enthusiastic, as Marsha Boyle told us this morning, PI Connect Principal Investigator and a member of the IDF Board of Trustees and one of my very favorite people. So I will now turn the podium over to you, Dr. Kate Sullivan. <laughs> Tara has really high standards, so if I'm one of her favorite people, that means a lot to me. So. Um, I have about 30 minutes of presentation to give, but I hope we'll give a context for additional discussions. I do welcome questions. We'll definitely have a lot of time at the end for questions. I've already gotten one which was actually really insightful, so whoever was so proactive, you already submitted a question, thank you. It's a great one, and I'll make sure I get to it um, probably at the end because it doesn't quite fit in anywhere else. So. Um, the concept here is I have a little bit of a formal presentation that is designed to talk about why autoimmunity happens, and then the last half will be on treatments. And we often avoid talking about treatments. No one wants to be uh, no one wants to be giving medical advice, but I think it's fair to talk about treatments for autoimmunity because the treatments have changed really dramatically, and the treatments are really confusing and there's no data out there. You can't go and look it up in a textbook, you can't find a journal article, everyone's sort of flying by the seat of their pants, and I get that it's a source of frustration. So the part where I'm gonna talk about treatments, it's really kind of a 30,000 foot overview, it's not very specific, but I hope to at least connect it to some of the things that I think you might be thinking about. So that's the concept here, but plenty of time for questions. So before we start, it's worth just stopping and acknowledging that autoimmune disease happens in lots of immune deficiencies. No matter what your diagnosis is, there's a good chance that autoimmune disease occurs in some fraction of the people with that diagnosis. It's actually uncommon, not unheard of, but uncommon for a primary immune deficiency diagnosis not to be associated with autoimmunity. So what I've done here is I've just plucked out seven from the over 250 different diagnoses of primary immune deficiencies, just to give you a sense of the spectrum. I just wanted to sort of paint the landscape for you. So you can see at the top, there's IPEX. 100% of patients with IPEX get autoimmune disease. So the percent is listed in the middle column, and then the types of autoimmune disease are listed over in the right-hand column. So complement deficiency, also very strongly associated with autoimmunity, and so on and so forth. And then one of the immune deficiencies that has sort of a lower rate of autoimmunity is X-linked A-gamma globulinemia. So you can see the spectrum is enormous in terms of the fraction of patients affected by autoimmunity, but it's pretty consistent across a lot of the diagnoses. As I said, there's a handful of diagnoses that are not associated with autoimmunity, but that's actually the minority, not the majority. Well, I want to just highlight that one of the organs most commonly affected with autoimmune disease is the GI tract. And I'm going to try and explain why that is in a few minutes. But it's a source of trouble for patients. I understand that. It markedly affects quality of life. And so the GI tract is not only one of the more common organs affected, but it certainly has a disproportionate effect on quality of life. So I want to make sure I address that organ specifically. But you can see, again, there's a broad range of organs that can be affected by autoimmune disease. So it really seems unfair, right? If you have an immune deficiency, you have too little of an immune system. So why autoimmune disease? It just seems like you should, if anything, be protected not have a higher risk for autoimmune disease. So as I said, I'm gonna talk about, my talk is really split into two sections, how autoimmunity develops and then how do we deal with it, painted in pretty broad strokes. And before I go any farther, I'm gonna stop and define autoimmune disease for the purposes of this talk. Physicians use the term um, in a little bit different ways, so different people can mean different things. So before I go any farther, I'm gonna say I'm gonna use the broadest possible definition 
that really includes autoimmune disease where our body attacks us in any way, shape, or form. So there are some people in research and clinical care that use a more restricted definition, but here for the purposes of this talk, any time our body turns on ourselves and attacks us, I'm going to say that qualifies as autoimmune disease. So that's what we're going to, so some of you may have heard the term inflammation as kind of a more generic way of talking about things involved with our immune system attacking us. I'm going to sort of roll it into one here and call it all autoimmune disease. Okay. So this seems way too simple. I know this is a really savvy audience, but I just want to start with the basics here because this is really the essence of how things go wrong. So remember, our immune system is either one of the simplest organs in the body or one of the more complicated organs in the body. I'm not really sure where it is, but um, in its essence, it tells self from not self. That's really the essence of what the immune system does. It does it in beautiful and manifold ways, but at its essence, that's what it's doing. And so the concept is that my immune system protects myself. I can't accept your kidney. I can't accept your heart. My immune system knows me uniquely as myself, and it won't accept anything other than me without attacking it. Now, there's a little bit of a subtlety here, right? So there's bad guys non-self. So there's E. coli, there's Staph aureus, there's rhinovirus. So there's bad guys non-self. But there's also things like pollen, there's things like splinters, there's things like, you know, there's things that we shouldn't be attacking because they're not dangerous. So how does our immune system tell the difference? Now, I realize that some people have immune systems that do attack pollen, but let's just accept for the moment that for most of us, we shouldn't be attacking pollen. So how does our immune system distinguish pollen from E. coli, pollen from Staph aureus? What's the distinction there? And this is a really critical part of the concept I'm going to try and get across. We have a whole system inside of us called the danger signal. Honest to God, immunologists call it the danger signal. We are no more imaginative than that, the danger signal. And it's a series of hormones secreted by white cells that put the immune system on alert. And that's the difference. These white cells that are responding recognize that pollens are innocuous and bacteria are bad guys. And that's the first step in mounting an immune response. So I'm going to go through the process, soup to nuts, and then I'm going to say it one more time with cartoons so that you've got a little bit more of a flavor for how this happens. Then we're going to turn it around and say, okay, what goes wrong? So this is a normal response to infection. This is how it should work. So a virus or bacteria lands on us. And one thing that I'm going to come back to in a few minutes is the concept of barrier. So our skin is a barrier, our mucous membranes are a barrier. We never talk about that because it's not very sexy, right? Who wants to talk about mucus? It's just not, you know, it's not what I want to be the hallmark of my career anyway. But it turns out that mucus and barriers in general are really hugely important. It makes sense, right? If you're not going to get an infection in your skin unless you have a cut in your skin, your barrier is broken. But it's more than that. Think about your poor GI tract. So your GI tract holds about two pounds of bacteria. At that interface, your immune system has to make very quick decisions. Fight, don't fight. Fight, don't fight. Every moment of every day. So in a way, it's no wonder that the GI tract is the source of more mistakes, the source of problems when our immune system breaks down. So this barrier function I'm going to come back to because it's really hugely important. Well, let's say a pathogen, a microbe, gets through that barrier. I'm going to talk about a sentinel cell, sort of a soldier that stands guard, called the macrophage. There's a few other cells that do it, but for simplicity, we're just going to refer to macrophages today. That macrophage is the cell that waves the red flag of danger. That's the macrophage that makes the initial, initial decision, fight, don't fight, dangerous, not dangerous. This is the cell that's going to put out the danger signal. Now, what this danger signal does is it recruits the cells that are going to fight whatever the problem is. If it's a bacteria, we care about neutrophils. If it's a virus, we want T cells. So it's different cells depending on the type of invader. But the concept is this macrophage is going to send up the red flag of danger, recruit the other cells to come and take care of the problem. So the T cells, the neutrophils, whatever it is, they're going to show up. T cells kill viruses. Neutrophils kill bacteria. And then we have a little bit of another layer here, and that's the B cells making antibody. Not super critical for eradicating the initial response to that invader, but really responsible for memory. So I had chicken pox when I was little. I have antibodies to chicken pox. 
I won't catch chicken pox again because those antibodies will protect me. So it's sort of our safety net so we don't catch things over and over again, and most of you in the audience know a lot more about that than I do. So, but the goal here is everything works well, we get rid of the pathogen, then we make these antibodies and it protects us for the long haul. This is what we want to happen, this is a perfect response to invasion. So let me just go through it one more time more quickly, but with some cartoons as uh, aids. Again, I want to highlight this barrier function that is going to ensure that most things that land on us don't infect us. But if that pathogen, which in this cartoon is the blue guy, um, actually penetrates our barrier, it will hit a macrophage. And these macrophages, again, are sentinels. They're sort of the soldiers that are standing duty. And when they see an invader that is a threat, they will put up this danger signal. And the goal of the danger signal is to recruit these cells, neutrophils that fight off bacteria, T cells that kill viruses, and then we've got the B cells making antibodies. So that's what we want to have happen every day. And um, just to give you a sense of how well our immune systems work, when we brush our teeth, we get about 200 bacteria into our bloodstream, and it's those neutrophils that keep us from getting sick from those bacteria. So I know most of you, many of you, have immune systems that don't work perfectly, but in fact, most of your immune system is working for you. You probably have selective dysfunction in one part or another. So what goes wrong in autoimmunity? And remember here, I'm using the term autoimmunity to include inflammation, anything where our body is attacking our cells. So remember that these T cells and B cells that are showing up to fight infection, they require training. They're not born understanding self. Remember the concept of self? They're not born understanding that Kate Sullivan's self is different than your self, that my self, they have to be trained Training for T cells happens in the thymus. Training for B cells happens in the bone marrow. Again, immunologists, such bad nomenclature people. So the T cells and B cells require training. So this training can be imperfect, and in fact, it often is. So T cells go through, as I mentioned, T cells go through training in the thymus. And the idea here that is that as these two types of cells go through training, if they look like they're going to attack me, they get removed. They actually get physically removed from my body. They get killed. That's what's supposed to happen. But you can imagine if T cells and B cells aren't wired exactly perfectly, then that message that you're not wanted, get out of here, you're going to be a problem, that that message doesn't get delivered very well. And so we end up with a population of what are called self-reactive cells. And indeed, that happens a lot in immune deficiencies. And I'll say more about that in a minute. Well, because this system is so important, our body has built in some safety nets. It's not possible to get rid of every single self-reactive T cell and B cell. It would just be too hard, and we wouldn't end up having enough cells left over to fight the things we need them to fight. So there are some safety nets. So one is this danger signal that I talked about. In the absence of this danger signal, T cells don't kill anything. They are completely inert. Without the danger signal, they will just sit there not attack anything. They can be surrounded by virus, but if they haven't seen the danger signal, they won't attack anything. That's a great safety net, right? It's the signal that says, this is what we want you to fight. It's a great way to sort of build in a little bit of a safety net. The other safety net that we have is something called regulatory T cells. These are T cells that are kind of the policemen of the immune system, and if they see autoimmunity, they try and go and stamp it out. These cells are hugely important, and I'll give you an example of their role in a minute. So what happens in people with uh, autoimmune disease? So sometimes the T cells and B cells go down the wrong path. They just don't get that self signal, and so we don't get rid of our self-reactive T cells and B cells the way that we should. So then we've got this population of cells that can potentially attack us. But another strategy or another problem that sometimes happen is that the safety nets can be broken. So the regulatory T cells, they also require training in the thymus. And so if the T cells aren't wired properly, people with T cell problems are uniquely more predisposed to autoimmune disease than any other category of immune deficiency. So when the T cells are not perfect, the rate of autoimmune disease goes much higher. So regulatory T cells get trained in the thymus just like regular ordinary T cells do. And so if they're not getting the right signals that say protect self at all costs, then they're not going to do their job as well. They're not going to be as able to 
prevent autoimmune disease. Now, there are a few more things that can happen. So the danger signal can be too strong. And I'll give you a couple of examples about this. So this danger signal is meant to live in a world where our immune system fights, relax, fights, relax, right? In a normal, healthy situation, the immune system is going to fight that virus and then relax and rest for a while. And then something else is going to happen, go and fight that sinusitis, and then rest and relax. For people with immune deficiencies, there's never that relaxation phase. It's one infection right after another. And so the immune system is sort of always on. And anybody that's running at full speed likely to make mistakes. And that's true for the immune system as well. So um, when there are chronic infections or when there's a reason for this uh, danger signal to be turned on too much, that's a setting where it's much more likely to elicit autoimmune disease. And I'm going to give you an example not from the world of immune deficiencies. But people with cystic fibrosis get a very high rate of arthritis. There's not a blessed thing wrong with their immune system, right? Their problem is in their lungs. But they do get recurrent pneumonias, they get recurrent bronchitis, and they get a very high rate of autoimmune disease because their immune system is always on. They never get that relaxation phase. And so mistakes get made in that circumstance. So just an example from outside our universe just to highlight that particular mechanism. And then the barrier function that I've tried to highlight, it, it might be imperfect. So this is, um, we think, more of an issue for uh, the GI tract than perhaps other, um, other part, other, say, skin as the barrier. So we know that um, men with X-linked A gamma globulinemia, if they get a gastrointestinal infection, they're much more likely to have long-lived inflammation. And we think when that barrier function is broken down, it's sort of a variation on the danger signal being too revved up. So they've got this infection, and of course it lasts longer because they're immune deficient, and so then they're more likely to have some regular bacteria penetrate. And so again, this danger signal is sort of always on. There's never this relaxation phase. So all of these things can go wrong, and I'm going to give you a few examples of primary immune deficiencies and sort of break down what mechanism is most operative. Of course, I can't go through all of the primary immune deficiencies, but I'll go through a few examples. So um, speaking generally, people with T cell and B cell problems, the lymphocytes may not get trained correctly. The regulatory T cells may not get the right training. Maybe the regulatory T cells aren't strong enough. Maybe they get made, but they're sort of wimpy. They're not really out there protecting in the way that they should. Recurrent infections can damage the barrier, and I think I've highlighted this a couple of times now. Again, it doesn't feel like part of the immune system, but in fact, it's critically important for the way our immune system responds to things. Recurrent infections can lead to a chronic danger signal, and this is a little bit tangled up in the barrier function idea. But when this danger signal is always on, 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 our immune system never gets a chance to kind of recalibrate itself. And this danger signal, remember, is produced largely by macrophages. And we know that people with neutrophil, neutrophil and macrophage problems are much more likely to get chronic inflammation of their GI tract. So I think that's a really um, potent example of the importance of this barrier function and this danger signal. All right, here's just a few examples. I'm just going to run through. I can't remember if I have four diseases or five, but we'll just run through a few examples here just to give you an idea of what this is like in real life, and then we'll turn our attention to treatments. So I picked two very extreme examples up front just to highlight the importance of these different mechanisms. So there's a disease called IPEX for immune deficiency, polyendocrinopathy, ectodermal dysplasia, X-linked. Um, and 100% of these patients get autoimmune disease. 100%. So clearly, autoimmunity is the dominant theme for this disease. Usually the GI tract, often the endocrine organs. And so why? What's the problem here? The problem is that they do not make regulatory T cells at all. So that whole safety net is broken. So maybe everything else about their immune system is OK, but when the safety net is missing, you get autoimmune disease. So just to point out the importance of how each thing needs to be almost perfect or there's a breakdown and you end up with autoimmune disease. The treatment for this disease by and large is bone marrow transplant. There are some patients who can do well with immune suppression and other strategies, but sort of the default strategy would be to do a bone marrow transplant because we know the autoimmune disease is so severe and so powerful in this disease that it's going to have a very marked impact on their quality of life. 
So today we would offer a bone marrow transplant, which would in fact be curative for this disease. This is another extreme example, then I'll move into more mainstream examples. There's a disorder that seldom shows up at this um, national meeting, but I just want to highlight it because it's a good example for what we're talking about, and it's called air deficiency. And uh, I know it's a funny name, but 100% of these patients also get autoimmune disease. And let's take a look at why. So they get autoimmune diseases like autoimmune thyroiditis, autoimmune disease um, of the parathyroid glands, they get diabetes. So really broad spectrum autoimmunity. And this is a complete failure of T cell training. Remember this training where the T cells need to learn about self and not self? So in this particular syndrome, they never get rid of the self-reactive T cells, never. They just can't do it. They don't have that equipment. And so they end up with a lot of self-reactive T cells and, of course, a lot of autoimmune disease. Even though their safety net is okay, remember, everything has to be almost perfect for the system to work. So here's an example of just one problem, and yet almost everyone with this disease gets autoimmune disease. Okay, let's look at a couple more mainstream examples. So here we've got common variable. Um, common variable, of course, is variable, um, but autoimmune disease occurs with a rate of about 20 to 25 percent in people with common variable. And it's a very broad range of autoimmune disease types, right? So we've got lung disease, we've got platelet autoimmunity, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, inflammatory bowel disease, back to the GI tract. So really, a very broad spectrum of autoimmune diseases in common variable. So let's take a look at why it happens. So we know that the T cells and the B cells aren't perfect, but this is not like the other two examples where there's a big glaring hole, there's something completely wrong. In common variable, it's a little bit more subtle. The T cells aren't quite perfect, they don't get perfect training in the thymus, these regulatory T cells, the policemen, they also are not perfect. We know they're a little wimpy in uh, common variable. So it's an example where there are lots of kind of partial problems that in aggregate set people up for autoimmune disease. And of course, the different people get different types of autoimmune disease. Well, as is true for most people with a primary immune deficiency, people with common variable, of course, get recurrent infections. Anytime there's recurrent infections, remember the example of cystic fibrosis, anytime there are recurrent infections, the risk of autoimmune disease goes way up because it's chronically turning the immune system on. There's no rest for the immune system, more likely to make a mistake. It's the same as me if I'm trying to do 100 different things at once. If the immune system is always on, always fighting, it's more likely to have a little slip up. Um, one more disease that I think is more mainstream than the first two, and that's X-linked A-gamma globulinemia. So here the rate of autoimmunity is not as high. About 10% of patients will get arthritis and 10% get inflammatory bowel disease. So this is the lowest rate of the diseases we've been talking about. It's a good example because the T cells are absolutely perfect. In X-linked A-gamma globulinemia, the defect is in the B cells. The T cells are absolutely perfect. And remember, I said that people with T cell problems are at the highest risk of autoimmune disease. But it's not the only category that gets autoimmune disease. So this is a B cell problem. The T cells are perfect, but the barrier function gets broken down by recurrent infections. And so here I'm highlighting the role of this barrier function. And when the barrier is not perfect, when there's infections, particularly of the GI tract, but also of the lungs, the immune system is on, the danger signal is on, and so we end up fighting things that we shouldn't ordinarily fight, like ourselves. So I think XLA is actually a great example. And then chronic granulomatous disease, almost exclusively associated with GI tract inflammation, so really one organ as opposed to the other disorders I've been talking about. Here the T cells and B cells work fine, it's a pure neutrophil problem, and so we can say with a lot of confidence, this is all about the barrier. This is exclusively a condition where the barrier is dysfunctional because of recurrent infections. You end up with chronic danger signal activation. Turns out in this particular disease, um, there's a problem with the white cells not being able to turn off the danger signal, so it's a combination of barrier plus danger signal, um, but a very, very high rate of inflammation of the GI tract. So just a few examples to give you some real-world ideas about how this happens um, in our environment.
So I'm going to turn my attention to prevention and treatment. Before you get too excited about prevention, I don't have a lot to say about that. I wish that we had a better, um, a better strategy for prevention, but uh, you're going to see that's a weak spot. So we would love, love to be able to prevent autoimmune disease. We know when we diagnose a patient that they're at risk for autoimmune disease for the most part. And yet we have very little idea about how to prevent it. So I'm going to give you some ideas. There's not really any data out there. These are just ideas that percolate around that we think make sense based on what I've told you. So number one is to optimize barriers, minimize infection. We think probiotics help, although we don't really understand if one bacteria is better than another, how much to use. You know, there's a lot about probiotics that we don't really know a lot about. But we think the concept of probiotics can be very useful in the prevention of autoimmune disease. Every time I... Um, talk about minimizing infection and treating infections, which we have to do because they damage the barrier. So we have to treat the infections. There's not really any question about that. I always get asked about the microbiome. So you've seen it in Time Magazine. You've probably read about it other places. The microbiome is big news. And I do think that it molds our immune systems. I think the microbiome has changed dramatically because of our environment, because we're using a lot more antibiotics. I think you could argue that many things have changed the microbiome in all of us. I actually think it's a pretty big contributor to autoimmune disease in the general population, and surely also for people that are immune deficient. Well, we know that we uh, alter the microbiome in a very negative way by using antibiotics, but we're a group that needs antibiotics, so what can we do about it? So, um, there are several studies demonstrating that antibiotics represent a risk factor for inflammatory diseases, particularly inflammatory bowel disease, but also some types of food allergies. So we know that there are consequences to mucking up the microbiome with antibiotics. But we also know infection is a risk for autoimmune disease. So I'm not sure where that, in any one patient, I'm just going to be honest here, I don't always know where that perfect balance is. Of course I try and be prudent, and I think most physicians try and be prudent, not over-prescribe antibiotics, but not under-prescribe antibiotics because that's going to get you into trouble too. We're always searching for that perfect balance point, and it's not always crystal clear where that is in each patient. So I'm just sharing that with you because it's, at this moment, a truth. I hope that truth changes, and I hope in a few years I have something different to say, but that's just where we are right now. For a few diseases, if you remember the first disease I talked about, IPEX, we know that the autoimmune disease is so damaging in that disease that those patients are much better off with a bone marrow transplant and a new immune system. The risks of bone marrow transplant are still substantial, getting better all the time, but still substantial. So you have to carefully weigh the risks and benefits every time you make a decision like that. It's a lot less clear for most of the other diagnoses whether bone marrow transplant would be beneficial. And there are examples, for example, Wiscott-Aldrich syndrome, where bone marrow transplants, if they don't take perfectly, actually cause more autoimmune disease. So we're at the very leading edge of this learning curve. You'll be pleased to know that there are national consortia really asking those questions. Who is bone marrow transplant appropriate for, and are there certain types of bone marrow transplant that are better in some circumstances than others? But it's too early to be able to say um, for many, it's too early for many diseases to say what that equation is. Okay, well, what about treatment? So um, autoimmune disease represents a threat to the health of immune deficient patients. I don't know how many of you have participated in some of the IDF surveys. I was totally blown away by two recent surveys that asked about gastrointestinal symptoms in immune deficient patients. It was actually the strongest predictor of negative quality of life compared to anything else that was asked about. GI disease has a huge impact on the quality of life of people. And I think IDF heard that, and we're hoping to generate a study to test different things as treatment. It was a very powerful moment for me to hear that. I would have guessed infection, but patients spoke quite loudly. And when I say it was the biggest indicator, by far, nothing else came close. So we need to balance immune suppression and host defense and treat the autoimmune disease. We know we need to treat it. It's not acceptable to just throw up our hands and say, we don't know what to do. So I'm going to give you some general broad strokes about how we think about treating autoimmune disease, always being respectful that this is an imperfect immune system, and so we have to tailor our treatments very specifically for immune deficient people. So the first-line agents are easy. Any, any physician would pick these as first-line agents. So for almost any 
autoimmune disease that happens in someone who's immune deficient. IVIG is already anti-inflammatory, so you can sometimes achieve some benefit by raising the dose of immunoglobulin. There are some patients that will respond quite nicely to that, particularly people with what we call autoimmune cytopenia, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, autoimmune thrombocytopenia. Those tend to respond to higher doses of IVIG, and what an easy move is that, right? That's a pretty small step to take. Steroids will often work. I've been on a lot of steroids. I have a total love-hate relationship with steroids, and I think most of my patients do too. They work fairly reliably, but boy, there's a devil uh, in there, isn't there? So um, long-term use has some bad side effects that we would like to avoid. So I will sometimes use steroids to achieve remission, but then try and use something else to help people get off steroids, because I know that being on steroids long-term is not desirable for many patients. Then there's what are called sort of the mild immune suppressives. So these would be sort of the first thing I would pick if I was trying to treat autoimmunity in a patient because they're not very immune suppressive. You don't lose much in terms of host defense by using these. You're not setting someone up for much worse infection. So they're, a, they're sort of a baby step to try and treat autoimmunity. So azathioprine or imuran, methotrexate or rumatrex, these are... Um, these have a very global immune suppression. They're like steroids, but sort of milder. Hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil has a very um, long track record in the treatment of autoimmune disease. It has not, although it's widely used by rheumatologists, not so many immunologists are familiar with it. It, it operates in a very specific way, and it's clearly good for certain diseases, but it, not um, probably the whole mass of diseases. Um, and then weirdly, antibiotics. So antibiotics are widely used in the treatment of inflammatory bowel disease because remember there you're sort of overstimulating the, the GI tract. So if you can sort of sterilize the GI tract, give it a rest, sometimes you can simmer down the inflammation. Doesn't necessarily work in other organs, but it is uh, kind of a nice strategy. So those are sort of the easy first steps and I bet many people in the audience have been on one or more of these drugs because they are so widely used. People feel rather not delighted, but relatively comfortable using them. So let's take a look at some of the other options. So for people that have what we call pleomorphic autoimmune disease, so autoimmune disease that crosses a number of organs, maybe diabetes plus thyroid plus GI tract, so people that have autoimmune disease that crosses a range of organs, usually we pick agents that are going to treat the T cells. And why is that? Because statistically, that's the, that's the cell that has most run amok in this circumstances. It's not the only way to go, but just if you have to pick something, this would be sort of your first maneuver. So global T-cell immune suppression, I've, ris I've listed um, my favorite drug. So tacrolimus, serolimus happens to be my favorite. Um, mycophenolate mofetil also is fairly popular across the country. Betalizumab is really only used for inflammatory bowel disease. Um, those are, uh, the ones that I've listed there are really global T-cell immune suppressants. So there's a big price to pay, right? You've taken someone who's immune deficient and now you're adding a drug that's going to really suppress their T-cells, the first line of defense for viral infections. Not surprisingly, once you up the ante and you're using these drugs, you get um, more infections. Um, hopefully not serious, but in fact can be serious infections. So this is not a step to take lightly. There's one drug I'll just highlight here called Arencia. How many people have heard of Arencia because of the television ad? <laughs> so they've done a good job. So it's a, it doesn't globally suppress T cells. It suppresses a very specific survival signal in T cells so that the T cells don't proliferate. And proliferation is part of the go out and fight, fight, fight strategy. So it's less immune suppressive than the other things I've listed there. It actually has a very good track record in common variable, and it's sort of, uh, it's not a baby step. It's still a strong immune suppressive, but it's not as immune suppressive as the other things I've listed there. Well, the side effects of T-cell directed therapy, of course, of course, more susceptibility to infection. But one thing I want to highlight that we don't talk about so, so much is um, the specific types of infections that we see. So, of course, the risk of colds goes up, the colds can linger. But I want to highlight reactivation of latent viruses. There are some viruses that we catch that stay in our body forever. And thanks to all of the advertising for herpes zoster, I think now many people know that. So when we get chicken pox, that virus stays in us, but it can come out. 
and it comes out in times of stress, and it comes out in times of immune suppression. So immune suppression is a pretty substantial risk factor to reactivate these latent viruses, and they can be quite difficult to treat. They can be really fairly miserable. So I already mentioned prolonged viral infections, and any time a viral infection lasts a long time, bacterial infections can also occur. So this is not a small step to take. If you've landed in a place where you need T-cell immune suppression, then you need it. But um, good to go in with your eyes open because there are some risks. I'm going to say just a couple words about autoimmune cytopenias. Certainly in common variable, this is the most common type of autoimmune disease. And this is mediated in a specific way. This is much less of a T-cell-oriented problem and much more of a B-cell-oriented problem. So autoimmune cytopenias are when antibodies get made to the red cells, antibodies to the platelets. You can have antibodies to neutrophils. You can have antibodies to almost any blood cell. And typically the counts will go down. And those autoimmune cytopenias, they can be silent. Sometimes patients never know. They just go for blood work and it shows up. But they can be symptomatic as well. They're not as um, associated with adverse quality of life as compared to the GI tract disease, but they can be very chronic. So they can be troubling just because they linger and they're a nuisance and um, sometimes can even be a threat um, to health and well-being. So the first maneuver is typically steroids and IVIG, and that's actually successful in a fairly substantial number of cases. But there are patients who don't respond to that. And then our choices would be rituximab. Um, probably not many people have had a drug called Belcade, but uh, it can be quite helpful in these circumstances. And then there's a drug, the last drug that I've listed, belimumab, actually ha does not have a good track record. So it, is, it does qualify as a B-cell therapy, it does have a small track record in lupus, so it does seem to do something, but I would say it's less potent than the others that I've listed there. So it, it does probably have a role. It's a very new drug, and we're probably just defining the niche still. But rituximab would probably be the thing that most people would pick first. What are the side effects of B-cell-directed therapy? Well, immunoglobulin levels may drop, so not so much an issue for many of you, but um, for people in the general population that get rituximab, that's actually the biggest thing that they get monitored for. Similarly, poor response to vaccine. If you look at the package insert, that's what's listed. Um, again, not so much an issue if you're already starting off on immunoglobulin replacement. It often complicates diagnostic tests, um, meaning that it becomes a little bit harder to kind of suss out what the status of the immune system is once you've perturbed it in this way. Um, and I'll say someone handed me a question specifically about diagnostic testing that I'll get to in a couple minutes. It can lead to immunoglobulin requirement. Again, many people getting this in this room would already be on immunoglobulin replacement, but it can require higher doses after that. It does increase infection, but that tracks largely with the IgG level. For people that are on rituximab plus other immune suppressives, then the risk of infection goes up again. So. Um, in general, rituximab is pretty safe. You tend, up not, you tend to not increase the risk of infection in the immune deficient population specifically, so we consider it pretty safe to use. And uh, I think my last couple slides are about GI tract disease. So inflammation of the GI tract, arthritis, or granulomas. Here we're actually going to treat a whole different cell. Remember I talked about danger, 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 and how that's the macrophages? Macrophages are a myeloid cell. So these treatments are all about simmering down that category, simmering down the danger cells. Because if you can sort of suppress that, you can often decrease the inflammation. I've listed a number of them here. These are all, all of the ones under TNF inhibitors, they all do the same thing. They're very different drugs, but their goal is the same thing, and it's decrease the danger signal. That's what this is doing. Um, under that, I've listed ustekinumab or Stelara. This is an IL-12 inhibitor. This is, IL-12 is another danger signal that comes out. This is used primarily for psoriasis, but it does have some role in inflammatory bowel disease, and it is approved for that use. And then for folks that are resistant to those interventions, we will go to T-cell-directed therapy at that point, and I've already talked about T-cell-directed therapy. What are the side effects of myeloid-directed therapy? It's different. We're not talking about viruses now, because here we're... At we're managing a different part of the immune system, and here we really worry about TB of all things. You know, you might think TB has gone away, but in fact, um, TB can be reactivated, and there are organisms that are related to tuberculosis that wouldn't normally cause problems that live in the dirt, and being on these drugs can render you susceptible to those types of mycobacteria. 
fungal infections, prolonged infections, and occasionally um, pro, uh, worse viral infections, although that's not a, a big part of this treatment. Well, where are we going? So autoimmune disease is being increasingly recognized. I think in the past, there was always a temptation to say, if the patient's immune deficient and they're having a problem and you can't sort it out, of course it's infection, right? They're immune deficient. Of course it's infection. So treat with antibiotics, treat with more antibiotics. And I think um, people are getting better about recognizing autoimmunity in people that are immune deficient. It's still quite tricky, um, but I think people are getting better. The treatments are evolving rapidly. 90% of the medications that I listed are new within the past 10 years. This is a huge area of research, and it's moving very, very quickly. In fact, immune deficient patients have inspired the development of a number of these drugs. It's actually an interesting sort of uh, combination of the pharmaceutical industry looking to the patients for advice and guidance. We don't always know how these drugs work in immune deficient people. They haven't been tested in that population. So uh, if you're involved with PI Connect, you know that we will be asking you if you've had unusual adverse events related to the use of these, because it's the only way we're going to find out. So uh, do you want to help? So your voice is needed. You knew this was coming, right? Um, your voice is needed to help identify who's getting autoimmune disease and what treatments are working. If you're not a member of um, PI Connect, please think about it. We need to really start cataloging what treatments are working for people. So with your help, we can do better. And thanks very much. I actually, oh, go ahead. <laughs> get it over, get it out. Okay. I just want to read, um, I think there are some questions coming up. And while they come up, I just want to read this one question, which was really insightful. So how reliable are antibody tests on, for people that are receiving IVIG? For example, are thyroid antibodies reliable, lupus panel, ANA, myositis panel? Should we be treated more by our symptoms or more by the lab? Hugely important, and 99% of physicians don't get that. So it's not that those autoantibodies are useless, but they are much, much harder to interpret. So IVIG all by itself will have a little bit of autoantibodies, and so it becomes very hard to know which of those autoantibodies are being produced by the patient and how much is just along for the ride from IVIG. So typically what we'll do is we'll look for IgM antibodies, which can only come from the patient, or we'll look for a rise over time. But it's actually very tricky, and I thank whoever wrote this question. Really important. In fact, I'm going to put it in my next talk. Um, have you seen patients with common variable develop uh, CIDP, which is a peripheral neuropathy that's also treated with high-dose IVIG? Um, I, I can't say that I have. It would be a great question to put to the USID net or the PI Connect registry. Um, I would, uh, of, of course it can happen. Virtually every autoimmune disease has been described in people with common variable. This is not one that I've heard people talk about, but I don't see why it couldn't happen. I talked a little bit too much, so let me just... Uh, What's the correlation between one family member with a primary immune deficiency and multiple family members having several different autoimmune diseases? Thank you, whoever wrote that. So we've known for decades and decades and decades that families that have immune deficiency have a higher rate of family members with autoimmunity. That's been written, honestly, I can think of a paper written in the 70s that talked about just that. IgA deficiency in family members with autoimmunity, common variable in family members with autoimmunity. It's been recognized for eons and eons. In the past year, just this past year, there are now three immune deficiencies that have been described in which the whole spectrum can occur in one family. So in other words, one patient can get autoimmune disease, another patient can get immune deficiency. And in our clinic, we're testing all of our families that have that picture for those three immune deficiencies. Has everyone got it? Nope. In fact, the majority haven't. But the importance is that for the families that carry that gene, the treatment is really different. So thank you for asking that question. Do I know of any autoimmune disorders that involve white lumps on the face but also can be on other parts of the body? No. And do I know of any autoimmune disorders associated with scalp lesions that are not psoriasis? Um, psoriasis would certainly be the most common scalp autoimmune disease, but actually um, there are lots of infections that can weirdly look like psoriasis, so fungal infections in particular can look a lot like psoriasis. I've been fooled a few times. <laughs> 
Is there a known relationship between common variable and systemic scleroderma? Interesting question. Scleroderma is actually not strongly associated with immune deficiencies. I'm not saying it never happens, but it's actually, um, of all the autoimmune diseases I can think of, this would be one that has perhaps the least strong association with immune deficiency. So I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but it's not a very strong association. My immunologist reduced my IgG dosage for common variable, and then Sjogren's went into flare. Um, we, do, we do hear of that, not just Sjogren's, but any autoimmune disease. The, um, the immunoglobulin dose is tapered, or the insurance company wouldn't approve it, and they miss a month. We, we do see that. It happens actually quite commonly with autoimmune cytopenias. I haven't heard of Sjogren's flaring, but I can easily see where it would. Um, there's sort of a repeat question, a long history of autoimmune illness in my family with um, immune deficiency. I already have ITP. Yes, again, for the reasons that I just mentioned, we would do extensive testing on your family to make sure you don't have one of these three immune deficiencies that would engender different treatments. Um, <laughs> coming, coming at me. So one is called CTLA-4 gain of function. You're going to hate these because they all sound um, just letters. So CTLA-4 gain of function. PI3 kinase gain of function, and PKC delta gain of function. Really sexy names, right? Just roll off the tongue. So um, if you want them, we can put them, um, I'm trying to think of the best way to get the word out. Um, maybe we'll put it on Facebook or we'll try and do something like that, because I know it's hard. They're not very easy to remember. Should we stop? I think that's, I think so. Okay. I think that's all we have time for. Okay, I'm sorry. There are three I didn't get to. I will be here for a couple of minutes if you want to just come up and ask me. Thank you.